talk about longleaf pine ecosystems, uh, whether you're um, in Virginia or Texas or anywhere in between, um, and certainly here in the mountain longleaf pine lands, uh, fire is an integral part of it. Uh, when uh, you talk to longleaf folks like myself, uh, sometimes it may seem like we're consumed with a, a passion and interest for fire, and I reckon that's true. The longleaf pine ecosystem, which covered about 92 million acres in the southeast, evolved with fire. It was the primary natural disturbance that drove the entire ecosystem, uh, primarily from lightning strikes, of course, originally thousands and thousands of years ago. Uh, Native Americans also burned frequently and commonly throughout the southeast. Fire is an, as important to longleaf pine forests as, as rain is to the rainforest, or, or tides are to tidal marshes. And we can maintain longleaf pine forests without fire, but to have the full suite of species and, and that biological diversity that is endemic to these forests, uh, we need fire. In it. And in much of the southeast, it's not a matter of if the land's going to burn, it's a matter of when. And if we can choose that when, we're all better off. Uh, which Smoky Bear was, you know, obviously proven to be uh, a false recommendation. Yeah. Prescribed fire is the lifeblood of the longleaf pine ecosystem. You can have all the longleaf in the landscape, but without fire, it just does not function. We do a lot of controlled burning on the property, um, probably upwards of 4,000 acres a year, and that's uh, very vital to maintaining that longleaf pine ecosystem. When I see the, the regrowth that comes uh, after these burns, uh, it's very rewarding. and, and uh, we know it's, it's good for the, for the ecology. We know it's good for the bird. We know it's good for the forest. And as a natural resource manager working for the Marine Corps, I also know it's very good for the Marine Corps mission. Prescribed fire is probably the most important management tool that we but use. Certainly prescribed fire has to be the most important tool that we have. Fire is the most important process in longleaf pine forests. Reintroduce fire into the system. When everybody talks about longleaf, they think of fire importance of fire. Yeah, we need to continue prescribed burning. Because burning is that important. I've, I've seen it all. I mean, when, when uh, in 1975, the Southern Station, Southern Forest Experiment Station at that time decided that they weren't going to follow in the lead of the, the region, you know, saying we you know all we needed about longleaf, there's no future for it, we're not going to do research in it anymore. Well, I did my first little research project on red cockaded when I was 15 years old. I mean, it certainly has gone from being a species that, that nobody knew anything about um, and paid any attention to, to you know, being uh, one of the most well-studied species of any kind anywhere in the world, I think. As a student and as a, as a scientist, I've seen the whole sweep of this recovery effort and there was a period when there was real pessimism about the the prospects of recovery for this species um, everywhere the scientists looked there was decline of the species populations were on the ropes and it wasn't until we developed some some good management techniques things that could be implemented that uh, the bird responded to immediately, and that is the inserts providing the cavities for the woodpeckers instead of waiting for the woodpeckers to make them themselves. And um, once that started, there was a turn in the, in the attitude of the scientists uh, and a real optimism. Um, I think I've seen uh, uh, a lot more cooperation from private landowners in Georgia over the last few years. Um, primarily because of the Safe Harbor program um, and sort of the, the influence that it's had um, in getting good, accurate information in the hands of landowners. The first time we heard the woodpeckers were there, or your first impulse at that time would probably have been to go out and try to slip in at night and cut the tree down, <laughs> get rid of the tree, get rid of the source of the nesting habitat for the birds and take, get those out. Uh, we didn't do that, but it, although it was tempting, but we decided to try to play it a little, little more on the up and up and see if there wasn't a better way because we understood the birds are here, they're probably, probably going to remain here, so we need to try to learn to live with them if we can. That's, I'd rather live with them than try to live without them. 
Since my coming to this property 10 years ago, there's been an increase in uh, red cockaded woodpeckers and the longleaf pine management on the property. You know, prior to uh, Safe Harbor Agreement and being involved with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, it was really kind of a secret that there were RCWs on the property. And since then, we've developed a relationship, you know, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's more of an open relationship. You know, we share, we've learned about the birds, and there's actually pride taking in the fact that, you know, we have an endangered bird here on the property. One lady who is 78 now, before Safe Harbor, it was if they showed up, shoot them, bury them, and shut up. And now she's, she actually is wanting woodpeckers. We put in inserts, and she said the other day, she said, I would like to see some woodpeckers on the property before I pass. Probably biggest changes I've seen in the conservation of longleaf have been on private property and integration of, of red cockaded conservation, which goes hand in hand with longleaf um, restoration on military installations. Um, in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, we had some serious issues with the level of protection of red cockaded woodpeckers on military installations and the ability of military installations to do the training they needed to do um, to be, as they say, ready and prepared to fight. So we had to get over that issue, and we have very effectively. The military installations are now pretty much our fastest growing populations. Um, private lands was, a, was headed towards a train wreck with woodpeckers like the spotted owl was um, in the early, in the late 80s when it was listed, when the owl was listed. Um, so the, the issue of, of woodpeckers and the impact on private land and on forestry in the southeast was a large, emerging, and frankly, kind of an ugly issue in the mid 80s. Um, that has been completely turned around with the Safe Harbor program and with our partnerships with industrial forest landowners. There's a, a, quite a number of organizations and agencies that, that were not really involved with Longleaf um, even 10, 12 years ago that now look at it as uh, central to their mission. And, uh, so that momentum that's been gained, I, I see it as getting the word out to more and more and, uh, and uh, getting the word particularly to the private sector. I went to graduate school in 1979. I could put all the literature that had ever been written about red cockaded woodpeckers in one expanding folder. Now I have file cabinets full of the stuff. So, um, you know, when the bird got listed in the early 70s and then within the next 10 years, people realized that this was a species that could be researched. It also represented a habitat, the longleaf pine. So, you know, now, you know, it's just phenomenal the amount of attention and amount of information that's been um, gathered. Two or three different techniques to make artificial cavities, and I invented the insert technique which uh, basically what you do is take a chainsaw, cut a block of wood out of the center of a, of a pine tree and insert a prefabricated insert, if you will, uh, that's already constructed, uh, that already has a cavity constructed in it. It's something that I'd been thinking about for uh, uh, a year or two, just uh, ways to be able to expand the population, thinking about how you know, the birds weren't able to expand into new areas because you know, literally it takes a bird, you know, one to several years to excavate a cavity. And so birds don't do that. They don't leave their natal territory and go a mile, two, three, five miles away and excavate cavities. Uh, by the time they finish excavating a cavity, they'll probably be dead. So we needed to think of a way to expedite that process. I uh, uh, put the first few in and it was only a matter of uh, a month or two until the birds started taking to them. Uh, we were still in the process of doing that when Hurricane Hugo hit Francis Marion National Forest. Um, close to 70% of the woodpeckers in that population, which was our second largest at the time, were killed with that hurricane. Uh, a large portion of the cavity trees on the Francis Marion had got snapped off or blown over. So we kicked into high gear and took cavity inserts down there by the hundreds to excavate cavities all over. So that was one huge lesson from Hugo. 
artificial cavities work and how can we use them beyond just replacing a tree that had been blown over. And, and we quickly began using them as recruitment clusters, putting groups of cavities in a vacant 100 acres and, and we've never looked back. They were growing populations all over the southeast using artificial cavities. Recovery of the birds on military bases like Fort Bragg illustrates well how people have come together. When I was first working there, there was a lot of mistrust between the military and the conservationists. The military was afraid that they would be restricted in what they could do by having these endangered birds on the base. The conservationists were uh, accusing the military of doing harmful things to the birds. But over a period of time, by getting the biologists, the managers, the agency people, and the, the military folks themselves working together, everybody began to trust one another. We all have a common goal, even though um, each partner has a very different mission. I mean, when you look at the mission of the Nature Conservancy and compare it to the mission of the Army, um, you don't see a whole lot of overlap. But where they do overlap is, has been endangered species. And so it's because of that unique overlap among the partners that we've all been able to find that common ground and to focus on it and to set common strategies and then work towards goals to, to try to do something um, to recover the red cockaded woodpecker. Southern Company uh, became interested in carbon sequestration and things to mitigate climate change, absorb CO2, back in the mid-90s. And uh, our first venture into that was planting trees or partnering with uh, people within our service territory to plant trees on open lands that were pastures that were no longer being used or were not productive to plant those back into forested land. We had gotten a number of proposals to go look at uh, doing bottomland hardwood uh, restoration work in the lower Mississippi Valley. And while those uh, projects interested us from a carbon sequestration standpoint, I found that uh, I was doing some research and had some contact with some people in the Nature Conservancy. They made me aware of the uh, plight of the longleaf forest in the southeast of the southern coastal plain, how you know 95 to 97 percent of it had been lost and it was just a good fit for our company that uh, the major portion of region was right across our service territory and so it just seemed logical that Southern Company you know, expend some effort and some conservation efforts to uh, focus on longleaf restoration. The, the Southeastern uh, Translocation Cooperative is perhaps one of the greatest examples of a, um, a partnership that has helped to promote uh, longleaf pine ecosystems and red cockaded woodpecker recovery. And that particular partnership draws together people from agent, all government agencies that manage lands in the Southeast including military installations, uh, state, state governments, fish and wildlife agencies, and forestry agencies, as well as the federal agencies. We have a much better relationship with our environmental groups now. Uh, there's still concerns about, about certain management aspects that we, we work with them on a regular basis, but, uh, but I think the relationships are better now than they've ever been, or at least in the last 20 years. And we see uh, some real opportunities to work with these uh, environmental groups and non-governmental organizations to try and build uh, a better uh, habitat for a number of species throughout East Texas. We have this endangered species. We know where they are. Uh, we work with different organizations to ensure their health and viability and um, that, that in itself is a great return. In the modern world, standing right here, if you look around and, and you say you own this and all of a sudden you got to have some money. So you look around, what have you got to do? You can't, you can't sell this ground cover. You can't sell these flowers. You can't sell anything. You can sell these trees. So that's the first thing that goes, you see. And of course, it's, it, it, you, you sell this 500-year-old tree, then you've got to wait 500 years to get another one like it. By using both a, well, a combination of the pine straw harvest and some selective timber cutting, 
We've been able to maintain pretty good economic benefits from this land. It, it keeps the bills paid and, and uh, keeps the bill collectors at bay, so we've done, done okay with it. The red jacket woodpecker conservation efforts are hugely different today. Um, in the 80s, there was no interest at all on private lands, um, other than in the Red Hills in South Georgia. Red jacket woodpeckers on private lands were a liability in the 80s. Um, now they're an asset. We provide a commodity. We generate about $2 million a year in, in revenue. We sell timber and we also sell pine needles, which is used as a landscaping mulch. Uh, this supports and boosts the local economy. Instead of trying to manage for single species like we had kind of done in the past, whether they be game species or even the red cockaded woodpecker, managing for the ecosystem health and, and was the objective and the goal. And timber was uh, going to be a byproduct of managing for that health. We made about a million and a half dollars a year off of timber sales before ecosystem management. We still made a million and a half dollars a year after ecosystem management. It's just that instead of damaging natural resources by harvesting old growth longleaf pine, we were able to capitalize on harvesting sand pine, which was a species that was invading longleaf pine communities because of fire suppression. You can't grow a 400 year old tree in less than 400 years. And uh, so it's very difficult for modern human beings to, or like as far as I know, for any human being to accept time uh, in this world, but uh, if you look around, and certainly in forest management and the ecology of our, our native uh, 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 systems, uh, most of the real, real value uh, in every respect is based on time. Maybe it does have some uh, place in southern forestry. It may have some advantages, and as time goes on, the, the number of advantages uh, have been increasing remarkably. So and, uh, given the information we have now, once it's pretty well widespread, I think that, uh, that we'll see, we will have crossed the bottom and begin to build back up again as far as the acreage of longleaf pine type. I think that we will be able to maintain many of our, our areas that are now in longleaf pine forest and, and continue to perpetuate those but I'm not sure that we will be able to really bring longleaf pine back as a really one of the major forest types in the south unless there are some changes in regulatory sorts of issues and, and what we're able to do to manage that forest. There has been a lot of research done on red cockaded woodpeckers and I've had some colleagues tell me that we, need, we know all the things we need to know about our red cockadids. And we do know a lot. But I know this, I learn stuff every year, and I've been out there working 29 years, and every year I, there's something new I learn about them. And as you get data, there are more things that you can look at. And as you look at the literature, you see these holes that there's things that have not been published about red cockadids and that there's still a lot of research to be done if people want to do it. I'm very optimistic about longleaf pine and red cockaded woodpecker um, recovery in the coming years. Um, I think we've shown that there's been a lot of success throughout many um, federal and state lands across the southeast and with the Safe Harbor Program and some other partnerships and conservation um, as well on the private lands that Folks are not afraid anymore of the endangered species that are associated with the longleaf pine ecosystem. So um, I think there's a very promising future for saving some nice remnant habitats. The real trick, and it's, it's somewhat different for the South than compared to any place else in the country, is that long-term survivorship of this ecosystem and all of the components, in large part, depends on private property owners. I'm very optimistic. I'm very optimistic that the push to put Longleaf back into the southern landscape has been uh, an incredible success story. In the future I hope that um, we'll see more and more use of prescribed fire. Uh, smoke management guidelines are becoming such that it's, it's more challenging to burn than it used to be. Um, I hope that won't deter folks. 
local folks in the Sandhills region are um, very proud of their longleaf pine forests. Here at Pinehurst Resort, we're we're pleased that we have an endangered species, and we're pleased that we have the the, the systems and and the methods to enhance the species. Interest in restoring the longleaf ecosystem has been increasing over the last decade, and particularly over the last five years. But I think sometimes we work under the mistaken assumption that restoration is going to happen on public lands or it's not for me, I don't have a role in this besides giving money to some organization that's going to, going to restore land. And, and I like to think that there is a role for everyone, a sort of hands role, a hands-on role for everyone in restoration. There's a lot of pride in the fact that they live in a longleaf forest and they seem to want to know more about it. But as I was growing up in the um, 60s and 70s and, and, and into the 80s, you didn't see within a community it was a connection with their ecological system in the way that you see it now. The, the responsibility of dealing with uh, an endangered species, uh, and in fact an endangered ecosystem, is, is very huge. I take that very, very seriously. This land is ours to pass on to the next generation, I think is, is very real. And uh, uh, I, I treasure the opportunity to try and, and do that, and I value the chance to be associated with other colleagues who are doing the same thing. What, what keeps me working in Longleaf? And I, I really think it's just the, uh, the lure of discovery. And uh, I, I think about a quote by Janice Ray that, where she describes that a Longleaf forest never tells its secrets at first meeting. They are always revealed slowly over time. And what's more, there are a lot of secrets to tell. We deal with life, whether it's uh, the life of a uh, one of these old growth lonely pines or one of these lonely pines or the life of uh, uh, an animal that lives here or a plant that lives here. It's all connected and something always benefits something else. It's just fascinating to see. Look at the light coming through the trees right now. It's interesting to follow the sunbeams as they come through any forest and watch how the sunbeam it, beam itself penetrates the forest to the ground and it changes all the time of course because everything's moving but uh, that's a fascinating thing I think we can learn something from that too and as far as management's concerned. Uh, you know, we'll always need forest products and we always need to cut trees for that and for different reasons but when it comes to trees like this I don't have any problem being called a tree hugger. <laughs>